Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. So we so far have covered um, most of this unit on feature selection and lasso and maximum likelihood. And now we just have one real small bit to cover, which um, helps you with your next lab. <clears throat> And the idea is that it's very straightforward to generalize linear regression from one target to several targets. So what we've done so far in the course is focus on scalar valued targets. So if we're talking about the, the data set, we would have um, <clears throat> the i sample in the data set would have a scalar valued target yi and would have some uh, features collected in a d-dimensional vector xi and then our goal is to come up with a coefficient vector beta that satisfies this model where we say so the one is multiplying the intercept term in beta all of these features are multiplying the rest of the terms in beta and we're saying that all of that which gives us the scalar value is approximately equal to the ith target so <clears throat> In the, in the coming lab, we have an application where we actually want to predict several different targets from the same feature vector. And in particular, we're going to use k as the, the number of targets that we're going to try to predict. So <clears throat> here, what we do is for the ith example in our training data set, we stack those k different targets into a row vector that's y. I transpose. And then on the right side of the equation, what we have to do is we have to now stack k different um, coefficient vectors into a matrix that we'll call B. And so now, as you see on the left side, we've gone from a scalar to a row vector. On the right side, we've gone from a vector to a matrix. And when we put all of our different training samples together, I uh, going from one through n, we can stack things vertically. We can stack all these different row vectors into a matrix. You can look inside that matrix and we see that as you go down the rows, you see um, the data examples going from one to n. As you go across the columns, you can see the different targets indexed from one through K. And then over here, as usual, our A matrix, as we go down the rows, we have the different examples. And now as we go across the columns of B, we have our different predictors. So um, <clears throat> that, that's the extension. It's, as you can see, it's very straightforward um, in terms of the math. Um, we just have one little thing to describe when we talk about regularization, and it's really more a matter of terminology than anything else. So <clears throat> just to summarize uh, from the last page, imagine that we have standardized data. So that means that we know that the intercept terms in all of these, these betas, so the first element in all these beta vectors will go to zero. And for that reason, we don't need to have this column here. And we can just focus on this part of the matrix, which we call x. OK, so then we have this model. It's a simpler model with x. It has the b's without the intercepts. <clears throat> and as we did before, when we talked about maximum likelihood for linear regression, we can assume that there's some errors that relate our targets to our noiseless um, predictions here. And those errors are going to be Gaussian with zero mean and sigma squared variance. And they're independent, identically distributed. So as we know from maximum likelihood, negative log likelihood gives us this quadratic thing. And then for ridge regression, we would like to penalize the sum of the squares 
in all the different coefficients of this matrix. And so we do that by adding this term. And the main thing I want to point out here is the notation has changed a little bit on the norm. So when you see these norms, you see superscript little f. That denotes the matrix Frobenius norm. And this Frobenius norm is nothing but, or the squared Frobenius norm here, is nothing but the sum of the squares of the elements of the matrix. And that's exactly what we saw with the Euclidean norm for vectors. So you might wonder like, well, why isn't, why don't we write a little two there in the subscript here? And the reason why is because when we talk about matrices in the literature, the subscript two actually has a different meaning. This matrix norm with the two actually corresponds to the maximum singular value in this matrix. We'll talk more about singular values later in the course, but the main point is that when you deal with vectors and matrices, the meaning of this two norm actually changes. And if what you want to do is do a sum of the squares, then you actually are talking about the Frobenius norm. So that's what we put here. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Again, mainly just a notational thing. Now for lasso, as we know, it's, it's pretty similar. We have the same term as before, but then we want to um, have a regularization, which is going to weight the uh, sum of the absolute values in the matrix. Now, in this case, it turns out that we can once again use the one norm because the one norm for a matrix is just the sum of the absolute values. So that's fine. So that's that's one certainly one way to do it. Um, <clears throat> there is another way of doing this that's a bit more sophisticated, where what you try to do in this regularization term is you try to make that every row of this matrix is either zero or non-zero. So that is another possibility. Um, it's not something that you find in SKLearn, but it is, it is something you can find people talk about in, in some papers and so on. But this is just simply what we're doing is we're just penalizing the absolute value of every single element in the matrix. Okay, any questions about regularization here or norms. Okay. And then the very last point I want to make is that SK learns linear regression methods work very easily with these vector value targets. In fact, you don't have to do anything different in the interface. When you, um, <clears throat> when you give the data for your um, linear model to fit, you just give it a matrix Y and and it will produce a matrix of uh, coefficients B. And that's it. And you can ask it to do ridge regression. You can ask it to do lasso and it will do this. So, um, so it's very easy. Once you understand that it's possible, um, <clears throat> there's really no difference in how you implement things in SKLearn. Okay, so this will be useful for the lab. And that's it for this unit. Are there any questions on anything about unit four? Feel free to unmute yourself or to put it in the chat. All right, if not, we can move on to the next unit. And in this unit, we're gonna start talking about classification. And classification will be a, a major topic. We'll spend, um, the next number, uh, the next four or so units talking about classification. All right, so let's just start at the beginning. So as always, we have um, a motivating example uh, with some Python demo code. And in this case, it has to do with diagnosing breast cancer. So what's typically done um, when someone wonders if they have breast cancer or not is that there are some samples taken of cells, and then an expert looks at those in a microscope. They, they dye them, so they're a little bit easier to see. And that expert 
makes a number of assessments on various things you see here, like the, the size of them and so on. And based on that, they can try to make a prediction on whether um, this person has breast cancer or not. And so there's a, a data set that's uh, pretty common in machine learning classes called the Wisconsin Breast Cancer Data Set. And basically the, the target variable, the thing we're trying to predict in this case is whether the cancer is, or sorry, what, yeah, what, whether, um, you know, whether the person has cancer or not, whether the sample is malignant or benign. And the features they use to do this, they're on the right. You can see that, um, okay, so there's nine of them. So this, this last one, this is the target. One is not really gonna be useful. That's just some sample ID number. So from two through 10, you can see that these are things that the expert could have uh, gotten from looking at these. So like, clump thickness, uniformity of cell size, uniformity of cell shape, and so on and so on. And what's a little bit interesting is for this particular data set, all the feature values are integers from zero, from one to 10. So they're not, um, you know, they're discrete values, which is a little different from the data sets we've seen before. So, you can get the data from here. You can read more about it. Uh, this is the original paper that the data set came from. So <clears throat> let's try to visualize this a bit. Let's pick just two features to look at. And in particular, I think we're going to pick this um, uniformity of cell shape. And which is the other one? Um, Oh, sorry. We're going to look at this three and five. Okay, so again, these are values that are um, integers between one and 10. So it becomes a little bit difficult to plot this because all those features lie on a grid. As you can see here, they all take on these values. So they're, they're going to be landing on it on top of each other. So it's really not possible to plot a scatter plot as we usually do. So instead, what we have to do is um, come up with a slightly different way of, of plotting things. And what we're going to do is we're going to use color and we're going to use dot size to indicate, um, let's say, for all the samples that you know had had this, they had you know um, two and four as the two feature values. Um, we're going to plot with a red dot, how many of those samples were malignant. The more samples, the bigger the red dot. And we'll also plot how many samples were benign with green. So like when you look here, you can see that in the one one for all the samples that had one and one, uh, most of them were benign. And then, you know, as you go over here for all the ones that had two and three, uh, it's about you know some mixture of benign and malignant. And then when you go further out, all these samples seem to be malignant. Okay, so that's just uh, one way of visualizing um, a couple features in this data set. And again, what's a little bit different from what we've seen before is that the target is categorical. There's two categories. We're trying to predict either one or the other. We're not trying to predict a real number like we have in, in the regression problems we've seen before. So um, the main question now is if someone gives you a test feature, which is gonna be a pair of numbers, X1 and X2, and they ask you, do you think it's benign or malignant? Um, well, this is the data we have, you know, how, do, how exactly do we do that? <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about that problem. So that problem is called binary classification. It's binary because there's two possibilities. Um, so just in order to, to talk about them numerically, 
let's call those two possibilities one and minus one. It's possible to call them zero and one or whatever you like, but as we'll see for some of the development we do, it's it's sort of convenient to have these numbers um, symmetric around zero. But um, like I said before, we'll we'll consider other possibilities in the future too. So um, <clears throat> as usual, we're going to be given features, feature vectors with D elements. Now we have targets that have one of two values, and we have a training data set that has a total of n elements. And then sometime later, we're going to, you know, with this, we're going to design our classifier. Then sometime later, someone's going to give us a test vector, which we'll call x, and there will be an unknown label y. And our, our goal is to predict that y, and we can call it y hat like usual. So the main thing now is that the target is binary. Um, and like I said, we can, we can use different ways to describe it mathematically. We'll use one and minus one for now. So there's many, many applications of this. Um, here's a couple. So maybe uh, a farmer wants to automate uh, their farming process and they want to have a camera go around their field and determine whether a plant is a, a weed or a crop. And if it's a weed, maybe they have a robot uh, get rid of it. And this is actually uh, definitely something that's happening now. So here, you know, it's, it's binary, weed or crop. <clears throat> uh, another example that we just saw are, are these cells cancerous or not? So as you can imagine, there's many, many applications where you have a, you want to uh, categorize a choice between two things. Now, um, <clears throat> in this case, the features that you're given would actually be all the pixels in this image. So this is potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands uh, or, or maybe even millions of features. And so um, those numbers are, are quite large. Uh, we'll eventually talk more about how to handle that when we talk about deep neural networks. But in principle, you know, it's just a vector. You can vectorize all these pixels, and then you have a vector for a very large number D. <clears throat> so when we think about this classification, binary classification uh, problem, uh, again, our objective is to predict the label. We, we want to design a classifier. And we can think of that classifier as a function, let's just call it f for now, a function that we apply to our test feature. And it should return an answer that is either one or minus one, you know, like weed or crop. And um, so that's a little bit different from what we've seen before, where we were returning uh, a real number that was, you know, from a continuum. Now we want to return number from the set one or minus one. And what we want is that our guess equals the true y with high probability. So one thing that we can do now that we couldn't before is we can think about um, this function f in terms of its decision regions. So <clears throat> by decision regions, um, we mean, in this case, for, for the binary classifier, we have two. So one decision region would be the decision region associated with the output minus one. That's the set of all feature vectors x such that fx equals minus one. Or we have the region associated with the value one, the set of all x such that fx equals one. And if you want to visualize this, we can go on the right and we can see that this is an example with d equals two. So for example, on this axis, we would have x1, the first feature on this, we'd have x2, um, the second element in the feature vector. And <clears throat> we could build a classifier where region one would be there and then region two is here. And so depending on uh, if I'm given any any pair x1, x2, like maybe that lands here, I just can say, okay, what region am I, 
what region am, am I in? I'm in region one, therefore I return one. So I, I see that I, I wasn't consistent here. Let me let me um, call this region here minus one instead of two. Okay. So just by looking at the region, um, we can immediately see the classification output, and that's that's a, a different way of categorizing uh, or of, of describing or thinking about predictors than we've done before. So in this case, it's you know this boundary, the one that separates the regions, is very important. It's it's a matter of what side of the boundary you fall on. We'll be talking a lot more a lot more about boundaries in the next few slides. All right. <clears throat> Any questions on anything? All right. So there's many different ways to do binary classification, but let's start with one of the simplest. This is going to be binary linear classification. So in binary linear classification, we can think of it as a two-step process. The first step is to compute what we call a score, or sometimes it's called the discriminant. And it takes this form here. I'm gonna put a box around it because it's pretty important. Okay, so <clears throat> what we have here is we have our features X like always, and we have some new coefficients that are actually very similar. Uh, it's, there's a notational change here. So, let me just clarify. So in the last few units, we talked about some coefficients beta zero through beta D. And all I'm doing here is I'm just giving these things a new, new name just to be consistent with what you see in most of the classification literature. So it's like this. So, so instead of thinking about uh, beta zero through beta D, replace beta zero with B, place all the other betas with Ws. And conceptually, they're, they're the same. So it's, um, so this equation looks very much like our, our uh, linear predictor. But that's only the first step. The second step is once you get this quantity Z, the score, you threshold the score, threshold the score to obtain this binary output. So if Z is zero or positive, we will output one. If Z is negative, we'll output minus one. So this is the two-step approach for binary linear classification. Um, again, the weights, W, we can stick those in a vector and the intercept. These are um, coefficients that we would like to fit to the training data. Exactly how we do that is gonna be the main uh, you know, subject of, of this unit. Um, but what's interesting is once, once you've done this and you plot uh, the, the classification boundary, which is essentially like you know, the, what corresponds to this, when you plot that boundary, you can see that it's linear. It's a line. This is a line in two dimensions. So here again, this would be the case when we have two features. But if, even if you have more than two dimensions, then this is a plane, it's what we call a hyperplane. Um, and the reason why has to do with this linearity. So it's good to, to just step back for a moment and say, well, what do we mean by linear? What, what exactly is linear? So there's actually two different forms of linearity going on in this equation. On one hand, the, the variable Z is linear in the parameters that we want to adjust, beta and WJ. And so by linear, we mean that Z is just some scalar multiples of the Bs and the WJs. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, Z is also linear in the features XJ. And that once again, Z is just a shift plus some scalar multiples of the xj's. So the linearity is really coming here in, in two different forms. And, um, and the effect of this is that this boundary here 
is aligned. Okay, so um, let's look a little bit closer at this boundary. So <clears throat> when you look at this rule, you can see that the, the Z that you are most uncertain about is, is exactly when Z is zero, because that is exactly on the boundary be between deciding one or minus one. And in fact, you know, here we've assigned the point Z equals zero to give you one, but you could probably assign it to minus one without really changing anything, because the chance that Z is exactly equal to one, or sorry, exactly equal to zero in practice is probably gonna be you know, almost no chance at all because these numbers, the Bs and the Ws, these are going to be some floating point numbers in most cases, the XR2, and the chance that this is exactly zero just almost never happens. But in any case, if it was zero, that would be exactly on the boundary between deciding between these two options. And, um, and so that means that this, this describes a set of points where Z equals zero, that, that boundary. So here, knowing that, we can kind of figure out what the decision regions are and what the boundary is mathematically. So if z equals zero, and we know from above z is this, that means that the set of x that yield zero z can be described this way. It's the set of x such that b plus x transpose w equals zero. And that set of x is exactly this hyperplane here, it's exactly that hyperplane. <clears throat> That's the set. That is what separates our two decision regions. So, you know, we have one decision region here, in this case, and the other decision region here. And you can see that on the right, we are going to make some mistakes on the training data because there are some red points over here. So those red points would be classified as blue points. Similarly, these blue points would be classified as red points. So the decisions are not perfect. Um, that's what tends to happen with real world data. Here's a case where the decisions are perfect, but this is a synthetic example that we made up. <clears throat> so the main point is that when you do this binary linear classification, your decision boundary is a linear in X. Okay, so we would like to know a little bit more about um, you know how often this happens and so on. Okay, so in the ideal case, we would have a data set such that there is a gap between the, the samples from one class and the samples from the other class. And as you can see in this, this toy example, there is a gap between these. And that means there's many different ways that we can make decision boundaries that perfectly separate this data. And these kinds of data sets, we have a name for them, they're called linearly separable. Um, so again, linearly separable means that there exists a hyperplane that separates the samples xi according to their class yi. So on one side of this hyperplane here, you have all the samples from one class. On the other side of the hyperplane, you have all the samples from the other class. Um, as you can see from this figure, it's usually not unique when, when it exists, because here both this red line and this blue line can separate the data as you see. So there's tends to be either, either you can do this in many ways or you can't do it. Let's look at some cases where you can't do it. So all the figures on the right, except for this figure, are not are show data sets <clears throat> that are not linearly separable. And this is what tends to happen in practice. So if we start at the top, you can see the red points and the blue points are mixed together such that I cannot draw any line that separates this. Um, and so that would that means that a linear classifier would definitely make errors. Even on this next one here, there's no way that I can draw a line that perfectly separates this into the red and blue. And so um, 
you know, this, this would show what a good linear classifier is doing. It's going to do pretty well, but it is going to make some errors. On the other hand, down here, we have another example where there's really going to be no good linear classifier. Linear classifiers are always going to make lots of errors on this data set. So when we use linear classifiers, you know, these, these intuitions um, help us to know what, whether or when, when this is going to work well or not. So you might ask, you know, why are we doing linear classification if it simply can't uh, solve problems like these? <clears throat> so there's several reasons. Uh, first, um, it's relatively easy to understand <clears throat> compared to other methods we'll talk about later. It facilitates feature selection, which we just learned about. And what that means is that um, once you fit your classifier, you can look at these different weights. And if a weight is larger, this is assuming the data is standardized. If a weight is larger, that means that that feature is more predictive of the label Y. So, you know, as we, we've seen, there's definitely an application for that. You might want to know in this uh, breast cancer diagnosis, which of those different features are most important to diagnosing breast cancer. Okay. But there's actually another reason, which is <clears throat> very powerful reason, can incorporate nonlinear feature transformations in the data. And then we can apply linear classification to that and get a very powerful method. So let's consider this last example down here. So as we saw in the original features, x1 and x2, the data is not linearly separable. There's no way I can split it cleanly. But what if I created a new feature? I'll call it x prime. And I create that by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of x1 and x2. And let's also assume that the zero, that the origin is going through the center of that circle. So now you can see that what this new feature is telling us is just the radius uh, around this origin. So if I threshold this new feature at a certain value, I can create this boundary and I can perfectly separate that data set. So even though in your classification on the raw features might seem very weak. If we allow ourselves to do some nonlinear transformations of the features and then apply linear classification, we can actually do very sophisticated things. And it turns out that when we study uh, later methods like neural networks, that all you, you can you can think of these these deep neural networks as doing many. Uh, fancy stages of nonlinear feature transformation and then finally doing one stage of linear classification when they're done. So as we'll, you know, we'll learn later about how to do all those feature transformations, but it shows us that this kind of simple idea of linear classification is actually quite powerful if you can process your features uh, correctly. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's just all some motivation for why why we want to look at linear classification when we might need to do some processing to our data to make it work well. Any questions on anything so far? <clears throat> okay. So the next question is, um, how exactly do we fit our, our classifier uh, parameters, our intercept B, our weights W, how do we fit them in linear classification? <clears throat> so, you know, we, we learned all about fitting weights. We called them betas, but here it's very similar. We learned all about this in uh, the context of linear regression. So someone might say, well, I think I know how to do this. What I'll do first is I'll define the RSS as my vector of targets. So these are now going to be ones, ones and minus ones. And I'll, I'll set up this, this loss function here, and I'll just find the coefficients b and w that do, that do the best job in fitting 
those one and minus one targets. And then once I have those coefficients, I will apply them to my new test feature vector x. Of course, I put in the little one there to multiply against that intercept term. I'll get my score, and then I'll just threshold it. If the score is positive, I'll assign y hat to one. If the score is negative, I'll assign y hat to minus one. So let's do a little visualization and see if this works or not. <clears throat> so for that, we have this picture here. Okay, so what we have on the horizontal axis here, this is a simple problem where we just have um, single scalar feature. So this is D equals one. So that means this is our feature X1 going on the horizontal axis. Um, these are our Y values here. This is when y equals one. This is when y equals minus one. And so we have these x, y pairs, right? These are, these are x, y pairs. And we know in linear regression exactly how to fit the um, regression line to a set of data. So just visually, it looks like it would turn out about there um, because we know that we're minimizing the sum squared error between the line and our data points. So that's where we would get our regression line. And then this score is nothing more, Z is nothing more than the value on the regression line itself. So here's the score Z then. This is Z. <clears throat> and the last step is if somebody gives me, let's say a new sample X, this is my test sample. I just look up where that is on the line. I check, is this greater than zero or is it less than zero? And I report, if it's greater than zero, I report yes. And if it's less than zero, I report no. So that would be this last stage here, okay? And if you think about this, look for the zero crossing. Anytime the test feature X is to, to the right of this blue dashed line, you will report Y hat, equals one, and anytime it is to the left of that zero crossing, you'll report y hat is minus one. <clears throat> so it turns out that actually everything works out fine in this case, this whole least squares idea, because as you would expect, all of your training features would be classified correctly. They'd all be classified as one. On this side and all these training features Sorry, it looks like I meant to put a minus one here. All of these guys would also be classified correctly as minus one. And it also the, the boundary is right in the middle between those, those examples. And so everything seems to be fine. So the problem comes when I change the data just a little bit. Let's say I take this last point, which is actually the easiest of all these samples to classify because it has the largest tumor. So you'd think, okay, that's probably the one that's most obviously malignant. And let's take that largest tumor and make it really large. And so now let's repeat the process. So this is my new data. I fit my, least, my regression line to minimize the sum of the squared errors. And it's gonna turn out somewhere like here. And then, now I, I say, okay, that's the score Z. Whenever the score is positive, that, you know, for that feature X, I will decide that Y hat equals one. And whenever the score is negative, I will decide Y hat is minus one. And now the problem is you see that I would make a mistake on my training data. I would classify this point as minus one. I would classify this point as minus one. And my boundary is now quite strange, right? It's, it's, it's you know, if, if you just as a human were given this data set, you would probably say, no, I think the boundary should still be here. Um, these are the points that should be classified as malignant. These are the points that are classified as is benign. And, and so, you know, what happened? Some, something happened with this least squares idea. We can describe this just sort of 
qualitatively as when the data set is imbalanced, that is when you know, this is very much spread out and this is concentrated, uh, this least squares regression line gets pulled to one side and the threshold as Z will now make errors on the training data and therefore on, the, on some test data as well. So here you can see how it fails. And if we're asking what's the problem, the problem is that this RSS is not the right loss function for classification. We're going to need to think of something else besides this. The overall approach of the two stage, you know, first fit these coefficients so that you can compute a score and then threshold the score. It turns out that that's fine. The problem is not there. The problem is with this particular way of fitting the coefficients. That's the problem. Any questions on, on this page? <clears throat> Okay, let's, let's do the same sort of analysis of the breast cancer data in our demo. So here, when you, when you look at this data set, you can see that once again, this is one of these imbalanced data sets. When you look at where the green points are, are you know, clustered, the green points are all around here, whereas the red points are very spread out. So we have one of these imbalanced data sets. And if we tried to fit a least squares um, regression, um, let's see, this, this is sort of like a regression plane, I guess. We're fitting a plane and we're looking at it from above. Then this would give us um, a decision boundary that lies here. So we would basically say <clears throat> all the samples, this is, you know, we have X2, X1, all the pairs on this side of the boundary should be classified as malignant and all of these should be classified as benign. But you can see that because this data set is imbalanced, we're gonna be making lots of mistakes. All these red points here, I don't think, you know, as a human, if we had to draw a line here, I think we would draw a line somewhere around here. So there's no reason for, for us to classify all these red points as benign. Something is going on. And again, the problem is that minimizing RSS does not work well for linear classification in general. We can, um, we can let, let's think just a little bit more about where this blue line comes from. So again, uh, we know that the decision boundary is a set of points X such that the score Z equals zero, right? That's the point of most uncertainty. Now, in the case where this x vector has just two values, that means the w vector has two values, we can expand this into x1, w1 plus x2, w2. And then we can rearrange things a little bit to write it in this form. x2 equals a constant minus a slope times x1. And this, this thing here is exactly where this line, that's how we can draw that line. So we can see that, um, you know, we're plotting here x2 as a function of x1. We're plotting exactly this boundary from this equation. <clears throat> so that explains where exactly that came from. So here you can see as you change b and w2, the intercept, the intercept will change. And as you change the ratio W1 over two, the slope of this line will change. Okay, so again, least squares, um, unfortunately does not work well for classification. We need a, a different method. <clears throat> so this brings us to the first and probably well, most well-known method for binary classification. It's called binary logistic regression. Okay, so again, just to review, in linear classification, there's a two-step process. You're first, from the feature vector x, we compute a score z. Second, 
from Z, we just threshold it to get our final classification output Y hat, which is either one or minus one. So again, the whole question now is, how do we choose? How do we design these parameters? We know that minimizing RSS doesn't work well. And so here's the main idea. We're going to think for a given score, we're going to think of the true label as a random variable. This true label has two possibilities, right? So this is going to be a discrete random variable. It takes on either one or minus one only. So as we know, when we have a discrete random variable, we describe it by its probability mass function. And in this case, that's just basically describing it by one of two values. We have to say, what is, first of all, the probability that y equals 1 given z? Right. So this is where the, the given the score comes from. And second of all, uh, what is the probability that y equals minus 1 given z? <clears throat> For binary logistic regression, we use one of the simplest um, functions possible for this. And it's plotted down here in the lower left corner. And I think once you see the plot, it'll make a lot more sense. So the score Z is shown on the horizontal axis. And the blue line, or the blue curve, is showing the probability that Y equals 1 given Z. Okay. So remember that, remember how Z works. Positive Z should correspond to Y equals one, negative Z should correspond to Y equals minus one. When Z is exactly zero, that's the point of most uncertainty, it's right between. So therefore when Z is largest, you should be most sure that Y equals one. And that's exactly what's going on here. As Z gets larger and larger, the probability that Y equals one gets higher and higher. On the other hand, as Z gets smaller and smaller, you know, more and more negative, the probability of Y equals one gets closer and closer to zero. And when you're right at Z equals zero, which is the most uncertain point, then the probability that Y equals one is one half. So you really don't know whether it's one or minus one, both are equal, equally um, probable choices. Okay. So this is, this is the main idea. This is now our probabilistic model. Um, and, and this is the main idea behind um, logistic regression. So let's see. So we have uh, a few things to check. So we focused on the probability that y equals 1. But there's only two choices, y either equals 1 or minus 1. So if I tell you, that the prob if I tell you this, what's the probability that y equals 1? The probability of the alternative is just one minus this. So if you do one minus this, this guy here, you get this over here. So together, when you add this and this, you should get one. And you can see definitely that that happens. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so this function here is called the logistic function or sometimes called the sigmoid function. And that is, that is the main shape. It's just an assumption. It's, it's definitely, um, there's nothing that says that your real world data perfectly obeys this model. This is just a model that's convenient for our analysis, as we'll see. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, or actually very often, people write this in a way that you don't have two exponents, you just have one. So this is another way to write it. One over one minus one plus e to the minus c. So these are these are equivalent. It's just that this one is a little simpler because it has a single e in it. Okay, so this is this is our, our statistical model for binary logistic regression. Um, <clears throat> let me just point out here that um, for least squares linear regression, 
we had a different statistical model that was y equals um, z plus, I think I called it epsilon, where epsilon was Gaussian with uh, variance, or sorry, mean zero and, and some variance. We can give it any name we want, we'll call it sigma squared. So this is also a this is also a probabilistic model. So you know, in some sense, we've always been using probabilistic models. Um, here, it turns out that the relationship between z and y is is formed with additive uh, additive noise or additive uncertainty. Here, the uncertainty is not of an additive form, but it's very similar. If I tell you z here. You don't know exactly what y is. You have to come to this distribution. And you can see, OK, the larger that z is, the more likely that y equals 1. But the same is true here. If I tell you what z is, you don't know exactly what y is. You know y is probably close to z because this Gaussian noise is probably not so far from 0. But you never know exactly what y is from z. So in some sense, they're very similar at a high level. What differs is just the details of the uh, probabilistic relationship between Y and Z. That's all that we're changing. And it turns out, as we'll see, that this one, this, this relationship works much better for classification. All right, so this is a good time to pause. Are there any questions on this idea? <clears throat> All right, so, um, so let's just go a little deeper into this logistic model. So on the, on the last page, we considered the probability of y given the score z. What we, what we might really want to know about is what about, what's the probability of y given the features x in our model? So let's do this in two stages. Let's be really simple at first. We'll consider a single scalar feature x, and we'll also set the intercept term b to be 0. So in this case, we know that the score z is w times x. And we know that our model, our logistic model here, probability of y given x, is here it's written in terms of z, but all I need to do is plug that z in, plug in wx there. So now you can see exactly how y is going to behave as a function of x. And the plots here help us to visualize this. So um, from the last page, we saw this plot. In the last page, we considered the case where w was 1, essentially, because then x and z are the same. And, and this was the plot. It was you know, stretched out a little bit differently, but essentially it was this. Now, what happens if w is minus 1? Well, what's, what that's going to do is it's going to change the, the direction of the plot when we, uh, of this curve when we plot it versus x. So here's w is minus 1. So it has the same shape, but now you can see you go from high probability to low probability. <clears throat> OK, what happens if w is positive but smaller than 1? In that case, what happens is this curve gets stretched out more. Similarly, what happens if W is greater than 1? Then the curve gets compressed. It gets much sharper. So now you can see that um, you know, what, what, uh, what the effect of W is. So the sign of W determines whether the slope is increasing versus decreasing in X. The magnitude of W determines the sharpness of the transition. But so far, in all these plots, the transition is centered at x equals 0. So now if we bring in the intercept term b, that will give us the shift away from 0. And you can see that by starting with the standard definition of z and then just rewriting it slightly differently where you pull the w out 
to get this form. And now you can see that the effect of B, or in fact, B over W, it has the effect of shifting X or shifting the location where, uh, where Z equals zero occurs. So essentially the transition of that, the transition here, you know, where, where this crosses the value 0.5 is going to happen at minus b over w. So uh, w affects how the curve is stretched and the and the you know whether it goes up or down or down or up, and b uh, determines where where this transition is centered on the on the feature. <clears throat> okay, so that's all to try to visualize um, visualize this. Okay, so um, so now that we have a little bit more of an understanding of this logistic model, we can we can be a little bit more specific in terms of how exactly we fit the model parameters. And what we're going to do is we're going to use our new favorite tool, which is maximum likelihood estimation. And let's just review that procedure. What we always do in maximum likelihood is we first define or assume a likelihood function. This likelihood function involves our targets, our features, and our model parameters. In this case, our model parameters are the intercept V and the weights W. Uh, as always, Y is gonna be a column vector with our different target values. X is a matrix where the different uh, columns are the different features and the different rows are the different examples. So, um, and the maximum likelihood procedure is always the same. We say the model parameters are the ones that maximize this likelihood for fixed data values. So we've collected our training data, stuck it into Y and X. So those things are fixed. So the thing we're actually trying to do is adjust these values to maximize this joint probability. And we said that because there's usually some exponentials in this probability density function, mathematically, it's a lot more convenient to maximize the log of the density or the log of the likelihood rather than the, log, the, the likelihood itself. And we said that often what people do is they stick in a minus sign and then they minimize something. So this is what we, what we tend to do in maximum likelihood. And just as a quick review, when we did this for linear regression, it turned out that because of this Gaussian noise assumption that we talked about up here, the likelihood took this form. So for a Y and X for that data, we said that Y was Gaussian with mean alpha times, or A times beta, and a covariance matrix that was a scale identity. And so if that's the likelihood, then the negative log likelihood ends up being this uh, L2 norm times the scaling function plus a constant that is not related to beta. And so if I wanna minimize the negative log likelihood, all I have to do is minimize this norm and in fact, this norm is nothing more than RSS as a function of beta. So this is where we got least squares as we, we applied maximum likelihood to this Gaussian model. So the procedure for logistic regression is really no different. The only thing that changes is the mathematical form of the likelihood that we use. That's all. So once you understand maximum likelihood, it's, it's a very straightforward to, uh, procedure to apply to any problem. <clears throat> so, um, so this is probably a good time to stop. Uh, our next step is just to go through the derivation to start with our likelihood that we, we had from before, and then just to go through a, a small derivation to find out exactly what that likelihood value is so that we can hope to optimize it. But we're out of time for today, so we'll just have to save that for next time. Are there any last questions on 
anything on, on today's lecture? All right, if not, uh, look forward to seeing you guys on Monday and we'll plan to be back in, uh, in the classroom. Have a great weekend. Thank you.